thank you, Loretta Jackson, for being so generous with your time and your memories, your research, and your love of this neighborhood. My name is Maria McWhorter, and today on Wednesday, the 8th of August, 2007, I'm interviewing Mrs. Loretta Jackson in her home at 410 U Street Northwest in the LaDroit Park neighborhood that she's lived in for, I think, almost 60 years or more than 60 years now. Well, <laughs> I'm very happy to welcome you to my home. And uh, I have uh, been here since 1947. I came here as a bride. And uh, I also um, came here while I married while I was a student at Howard University. But after I had children, I was a homemaker. And I went back to school in 1965 to DC Teachers College to study to be a teacher. And there was a program called Child and Curriculum. And it was a two, well, it was the last two years of a four year course. And I had my pre preliminaries courses at Howard University where I was a psychology, sociology major from 1945 to 1947. And uh, that's, uh, how I got here. <laughs> Excellent. So you said you came here as a bride in mm -hmm. 1947. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your husband's name, full name? My husband, Eugene Anthony Jackson, and uh, he was born in Lee George Park when his family lived on 4th Street, 1800 block of 4th Street. And later the family purchased 415 U Street, and he uh, when I married him, he was living at 415 U Street. And now we're in 410 right. uh, U Street Northwest. He purchased 410 U Street, and this is where we came to live. And uh, I've been here ever since. <laughs> so you raised your family here in right. Lejoy Park. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who's, who else well, is part of this family besides uh, your husband? I have uh, a son, uh, Philip Anthony Jackson. I have uh, a, my middle child, it was a girl, Carolyn. Uh, Ines Collins, uh, Jackson Collins, and my youngest daughter is Karen Loris Jackson Smaltz. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. And do any of them have children? Do you have yes, grandchildren? Yes, yes, I have two grandchildren. My son and his lovely wife, Wanda, have a beautiful daughter, Latara, and uh, my daughter, uh, Karen and Mark, have a son, Noah Malik Smaltz. <laughs> Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Now you had mentioned a little earlier about your experience uh, being a student at uh, Howard University and the uh, Minor Teachers College. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so you still, definitely the work that you've do been doing as a, as a historian of LaDroit Park um, have continued to be a teacher. Can you talk a little bit about your training as a teacher? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I um, taught in the, um, at Taurus Mann School for 25 years. Prior to that, when my children started to school, I used to be like a parent helper, and then I started uh, being a book clerk for the school system. And um, from uh, the, my book clerk job, it led to me uh, going to D.C. teachers to take that course. At that time, they were hiring. They needed teachers very badly. And uh, I took what was called the Child and Curriculum course. And at my uh, completion of the studies in 1967, in the uh, 1968, I was to have been assigned to a school, but I'd had a surgery, so I didn't go to the school. And while I was recuperating, uh, the chief officer uh, of hiring people called me and asked would I take a two-month assignment at Horace Mann Elementary School, 45th and Newark Streets Northwest. And I said, yes, I'll do that. And I went over there, I met the people, and uh, I, I enjoyed my two months there. A few days after I started teaching, Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. We had a holiday. Shortly after that, there was a 10-day Easter break. And one of my little fellow teachers said, oh, you haven't even worked a month, and you're going to, you are going to get a month's salary. I said, darling, I'm working every day, night and day, trying to keep up. So I haven't a break. break. It isn't a break for me. And I will be earning this money that I'm making. But I went there for two months and ended up staying 25 years. And that's where I retired July uh, 1st, uh, 1993. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Now, I wanted to go back a little bit to uh, talk uh, specifically about LaDroit Park and the LaDroit Park neighborhood. 
and you said you came here in 1947 as a bride uh, with your husband. Mm -hmm. What was your first impression of your LaDroit Park neighbors back in the late 40s? Well, I, I was about the youngest person of the household in the block, I believe, at the time. And most of the neighbors were quite settled and stayed, and they would refer to me as young lady. And uh, my husband was going back and forth to work, and as I was pregnant with my child, they took interest in me and couldn't wait until the baby was born to see what it was and, <laughs> and how everything was going along. And what I liked about it was the courteousness of people. Back and forth, they went back and forth to work, and they saw you in the morning, good morning, coming home from work, good evening. And um, I never felt out of place. And eventually, as I matured and got older, I looked after several of the neighbors who were young when I got here. Mm -hmm. you, you mean some of the children, you, were, you took care of them? No, I mean some of the elderly, of the people, like Mary Warren, I took care of her. I had a neighbor, Mrs. Noisiette, that I helped her as she aged, and Mrs. Monroe and her sister that lived next door to me at 412. I used to do things and look in on them because both of them were blind. And uh, so it came to be that I was an asset to my elders, <laughs> even though, uh, you know, they, they never mistreated me or acted like I wasn't good enough to be in Leedroyd Park. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that, uh, and the whole neighborhood, we had uh, neighbors on 4th Street, Elm Street, wherever. And you, even today, I see people that remember me, and younger people especially, and I can't They say, you still live on U Street? I said, yes, I'm still on your street. Do you remember me? I said, yes, I do, but I can't remember your name. <laughs> so that's, from the very beginning. Yeah, I just felt welcomed here. And uh, I was always a quiz, an inquisitive person, and I liked to hear uh, people tell stories or talk about the old times and old days. So long before I became involved in historic research, I had begun to get a feel of Lee Droid Park and the people that were here and the people before, and uh, the connection with Howard University. So it was like uh, just a pleasure when I got a chance to do the historic research. It wasn't like work. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, um, how early were you involved with a civic association or a neighborhood organization? Well, I didn't get involved with the civic association when I first came here. Uh, it was. I think I was at work, it might have been in um, maybe the 70s, because uh, we had a neighbor, Harris Taylor. He was uh, applying for a job in the school system, and they said, are you involved in the Civic Association? So he came to me, he said, Loretta, we got to go to the Civic Association. He said, I have to put on my resume that I am involved in the Civic Association as I apply for a job. So I said, well, uh, Mrs. Hill, a neighbor, said, oh, they meet at Miss Dickerson's house at 408 uh, T Street. So then that's how we came to, uh, it was 410 T Street. That's how I became involved then with the Civic Association and started going to meetings. And it had to be, um, I remember when the March to Selma was going on. Well, we had a meeting. We called it a coordinating council meeting, and we used to meet up on um, Gerard Street at a girl's name, Teresa Rector. And I remember we were meeting and James Reeb was at the meeting and shortly after that he went to Selma and he was hit in the head and uh, was murdered. And that was part of my civic involvement. I also was in the first uh, clerk in the first voting in D.C. in 1964 at Banneker. And I, I'm still a voting registration clerk. Mm -hmm. okay, wonderful. So that you got involved personally mm -hmm. in the Civic Association late 60s, early mm -hmm. 70s, but your knowledge of just the Civic Association goes um, back earlier. What do, what do you remember about, uh, in terms of your research, in terms of the, the early years of the Civic Association? Well, uh, I knew the current president, Lawrence Smith, had been a classmate of mine at Dunbar. And uh, the other presidents, uh, I wasn't too familiar with them, but I knew uh, Walter Washington had been one of the presidents of the Civic Association. And he and my brother-in-law were classmates and uh, friends. But uh, it, they always, I, I just considered it was an organization for older people. 
at the time until this young man needed the to say on his resume that he belonged to a civic association. So then I put it on my resume too. <laughs> Now, who were some of these early? So you mentioned Walter Washington. Who were some of the er other early leaders of the Dr. Early Garnet leaders? Wilkinson, Mr. Percy Roy, um, Mary Waring. She was like a stalwart character. And uh, Vivian Spears, whose father, Octavius Williams, was the first black to buy a home in Lee Joy Park. We all knew about Mary Church Terrell's house, she and her sister having lived there. Uh, Esther Payton and her father, Fountain Payton, and we also knew that he had been on the school board as well as Mary Church Terrell. Um, my father-in-law used to have a store at the house he owned on 4th Street, and he had been a little storekeeper for a long time. And um, there were um, um, uh, Patricia Roberts Harris was a rumor in the house that now Jesse Jackson and his wife lived in. And on T Street, there was Dr. Walker, uh, Mr. Louis Vaughn, who was an architect teacher at Armstrong High School. And um, his daughters, uh, both of them were teachers, Lorraine and his uh, younger daughter. And his son, I think, uh, was in architecture, but he, went to, he moved to California. And Dr. Walker had a sister that lived uh, next door to him. But they had a driveway and she was uh, Beatrice Walker and she was also a teacher in the school system. And uh, on T Street, we all knew Miss Hattie Riggs. We used to like to walk by and hope we could see a glimpse of her, this elderly Caucasian woman and a long dress. And, and she and her little sister, they sat up so straight in little chairs on that porch on T Street. And then there were um, Mr. Mrs. Dickerson and her husband, she played the piano at uh, Frazier's for funerals. And believe it or not, I do it now at my church and other places too. <laughs> and um, we had uh, Mr. Brown, uh, uh, he was in the math department. And then his son, Herschel Brown, was a school photographer. And his wife, uh, Alice, she and I, she had a baby late in life, so she and I were, I had, was having my baby when she was having her first child, but she was had been married a long time. And if I can tell this incident, we were going to a school one morning, and the trash man made a cute remark, and I said, "Isn't that terrible?" She said, "Oh no, girl. When you get my age, you're glad for a compliment." <laughs> <laughs> so we just, you know, walked back and forth with the children, and uh, all around uh, when my kids started going to Mott School. Well, we had teachers there that had ties with Lee Droid Park and Howard University and minor teachers' college, and uh, it and ministers. We had a lot of ministers that lived in the neighborhood. Reverend Williams on uh, El Oakdale Street. Uh, he was an elderly minister. I think he had been in the Civic Association also. And on Fourth Street, we had. Um, of a man, he was a teacher, and his wife uh, went blind. But he used to, um, I think he was the principal of uh, the school at 8th and T. That's now at 8th and T. But um, we also had a little laundromat right at the corner of cleaners at 4th and T. And the houses, the historic houses that were uh, on 4th Street where um, we always knew that Paul Lawrence Dunbar had once stayed in one of the houses, and Mary Church Terrell had first owned one of those houses. And uh, the Howard University Hospital, uh, many of the medical students and whatnot had, uh, when my father-in-law's mother lived at 512 U Street, she used to have a kitchen, and the students came there to eat supper. And they didn't have to pay very much, maybe 50 cents for a meal or 35 cents for a meal, something like that. But they liked the tie with the university. Well, it's interesting it, it, listening to you remember all of the, the, the leaders and important people that lived in the neighborhood, the, the issue of kind of deportment and having a sense of oneself 
uh, really comes, shines through. And, and you told a wonderful story about uh, Mr. Roy, I believe, mm -hmm. who, who uh, made sure he told you early on what you do and what you don't do. Oh, yes, and he drove on. that story. <laughs> oh, well, it was so hot as it's warm today. And I put up my ironing board right here by the bay window. And I had a plug right there. And I could look out the window and see people passing by. And I was ironing my clothes, and the bell rang, and I went to the door. He said, young lady, in Leedroyd Park, we do not iron in the living room. I said, thank you, Mr. Roy. I'll remember that, but it was quite warm today. <laughs> and as you can see in my house, it's cooler on the front. The back burns up because the sun rises over on the back. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful story. Park Civic Association and uh, in the late 60s and 70s and to, to have us talk a little bit more about the kind of projects and issues um, that you were involved in with the Civic Association. All right. Well, uh, around, uh, <clears throat> it was in uh, 1970. Well, first of all, our Civic Association grew, after I became involved, we grew in membership. And uh, we organized, uh, like having block captains and uh, having a, a place to meet, which was Florida Avenue Baptist Church. And uh, we uh, would invite uh, like people who were running for the school board to come and talk. Or, and then we joined the Federation of uh, Civic Associations where we sent representatives to the Federation. And also uh, in 1973, uh, we had a young man to come to the Civic Association and his name was Vincent de Forest. And he told us of a project that he and his brother were forming called the Afro-American Bicentennial. And at that time, I had not become aware of historic sites or how many historic sites we had pertaining to black that the National Park Service uh, took care of. And he told us that uh, they were going to, they wanted us to know that our neighborhood, Leedroyd Park, had a historic significance and raising awareness of black sites for the 1976 bicentennial of our country. And he said not only was it the architecture here, but it was the social significance of the blacks that had lived here and that were still living here at that time. So after talking to Vince, uh, he's, we met and we said, well, we should form a committee because he told us we'd first have to get information to prove that we could be worthy of being nominated for the site. Well, we uh, met at Mary Waring's house and we had a chairperson. This was called an ad hoc committee of the Civic Association. And it was strictly uh, formed to get information for, uh, call, that's why it's called the Civic Association Historic District Project. And I took on the job of being the researcher. I might have been the secretary, I'm not sure. But anyway, I set about to find out why this neighborhood was important, which I already knew it had a social significance of importance. But to find out uh, how it came to be, to find out that it may be one of the first planned subdivisions in the United States, and to find out that Howard University really, we always thought they'd come and take our property. They had a right. This property evolved from their campus, which uh, their land. They had land, but no money. And in 1873, um, the a trustee there and also an acting vice president, Amzie Barber, and another uh, person at Howard University, Andrew Langdon, got together and with the president at that time, decided to buy some land because I think they were involved with uh, Amzie Barber's father-in-law, LeDroy Langdon, in uh, property and building and whatnot. So they decided to buy some acreage from Howard and build houses. And they hired at that time uh, James McGill, a very prominent engraver, also an architect. Some people may have said he was not the highest rated architect, but he certainly made a, a name that's lasting for himself of the McGill homes, which we are still living in today. So that the so that that early history then of Howard University mm -hmm. originally having the land mm -hmm. that Amzi Barber bought from Howard. So a hundred years later, mm -hmm. there was still though that concern that the Park 
residents had the concern that Howard University was actually going to come back and take the land away. Not come back and take it, but they have had a plan. We felt they had a plan that would evolve all the way to Florida Avenue to use the land. And at that time, uh, we started having uh, more interaction with Howard University. They started sending a liaison to our meetings. And uh, as we proceeded with our research uh, to get things together, and uh, I found out uh, I found out how to go to the Library of Congress and read the old black newspapers, The Colored American and The Bee by Calvin Chase. And I found out information about the people who had lived here and uh, some of their occupations. And uh, it was, uh, I called all of that together and I wrote uh, a paper. And we met then with uh, people from the uh, uh, Susanna Gatchnowitz of the uh, where the people who would say that you could have historic district status. And in the meantime, uh, I started, we started touring of Leroy Park to raise the awareness of people that we had a historic area and the people living here had social and historical significance. And uh, I did tours in connection with the Smithsonian. And uh, we often would end our tour with uh, tea and cookies in Corey, David Corey's backyard, he had a beautiful yard with flowers. And sometimes it was at my house where I showed slides that were done for us by a photography teacher from District of Columbia, T DC teachers then it was. And uh, we would show the slides and a tour around Lee Joy Park. And I did that for 10 years. But in the meantime, from 1973 to 1976, the research evolved and uh, we got uh, on the register for as a historic site uh, with credit to Vincent DeForest and Robert, the late Robert DeForest, his brother. And based on some work that I did, they uh, hired me or contracted with me to do projects with their vast project of nominating maybe 39 sites for the National Park Service by 1976, where there had been about three or four sites. I think it was Carver, Booker T. Washington, Frederick Douglass Home. It was about four or five only black sites that the Park Service recognized, and it turned out to be more than 39 or 40. I'm a little shaky now, it might be, <laughs> it may have come to be more than that. They did many wonderful things. They got the family for a flipper. The, uh, Lieutenant that graduated from uh, West Point, when he went uh, out in Nogales, Arizona, uh, to he was a property officer, like taking care of money. Well, he used to on Sunday take a young lady out in a buggy, and of course she was not, she was Caucasian, and a jealous a soldier got mad because he was jealous of Flipper. So what he did was fudge some bad things on his record book. And when they discovered it, they accused him of, of taking money or something. He was a quartermaster, you know, from the quartermaster department. And he was uh, let out of the service with disgrace. And uh, he went back to Atlanta, Georgia, to live with his family. Well, the DeForest brothers researched this, and they got uh, the, his name cleared, and his family received the advance, the back pay, that he was due from the time he was discharged illegally from the service. And, uh, and his name now is cleared, and he had a presidential pardon by Clinton. So that was some of the things that I was involved with at, uh, you know, between 73 and 76. Now, I mean, one of the things that makes me think, and I hadn't really thought about this before, I mean, definitely Robert DeForest and, and Vincent DeForest with the Afro-American Bicentennial Corporation were definitely early pioneers in terms of the whole historic district and historic sites movement. But uh, I hadn't realized before, and you made it kind of crystal clear that it, that Lee Droit Park may be, in fact, one of the first black historic districts or predominantly black historic districts in the country, perhaps. Because um, the other ones you mentioned were actually, are actually historic sites. They're, right, they're right. named after, or they're, they were the homes of famous people, right. but we're talking about an entire neighborhood, entire neighborhood. here. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I do know that uh, it's possibly that it was one of the first, black, I mean, first uh, sub, the planned subdivision. Here you had laid out streets, 
you had the homes, you had landscaping, and uh, they were sold to predominantly people who worked in the government, taught at Howard, or something like that. And uh, it was near the city, and yet it was Washington County when it was first formed. But it was adjacent to everything that you want to have in the city, the Capitol, the White House, or whatever. And uh, now whether there have been other neighborhoods that had historic significance, I know like Rosewood or something like that, had tragic uh, remembrances that we had to share. But this was a neighborhood that did not have a tragedy for it to become a popular site for the United States. And so we feel that's a great uh, credit to the people who lived here. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to get a little bit into the kind of nuts and bolts of actually what it took to actually do the nomination to make uh, LaDroit Park a historic district. Um, were you or other members of the LaDroit Park Civic Association, did you actually do the nomination? Did Vincent DeForest do it, or, or how did um, that actually happen? If I remember, Teresa Brown uh, was on our board. She was on the historic district project. She and Susanna Ganschnewitz from the Office of uh, where planning or wherever it was, um, I just prepared the on-site study, the paper, and then I was not involved with any of the meetings or anything, though I did uh, go out and speak uh, at the Historic Society one time about Leedroy Park or something like that, but I was not involved with going down to the office. I know Vincent, when we gave the study to Vincent, based on that, he said, you, you all have it. You will have the nomination. And they were very proud of that. And after we got our nomination, uh, we disbanded because we were only an ad hoc committee of the Civic Association, so we didn't continue the Historic District Project. That's all it was, though we had been incorporated. So we had to, uh, we were paying a fee for incorporation. <laughs> we felt we didn't need to do that because we were just a plain committee of the Civic Association. So we disbanded. And that's, um, and then Mrs. Brown, as you know, became known to be the first black woman to have a preservation society in the uh, you know, U.S. So that grew out of Leedroy Park, become the historic district. And she worked for years with the historic trust. Mm -hmm. But it seems clear, though, that, that in terms of the Civic Association, that the research that you did and others did, that the tours that you conducted uh, in collaboration with uh, the Smithsonian, that those were critical to helping to make LaDroit Park a historic district. I would say yes. And I think that uh, at that time, I think it was Peter Smith and his wife, uh, they came first to ask me, would I do a tour? And then at that time, Letitia Brown, a professor at George Washington University. She was an advisor also, also to Vincent. They had many prominent uh, professors in, like Dr. John Blasengame from Harvard, and uh, they had um, Mary Berry uh, on their committee, and Janet Hostin. So they were uh, really, uh, you know, had prominent people to help with the uh, designation of the historic sites throughout the United States. Not only sites, but people like Flipper and uh, the uh, Fort Pillar uh, massacre to get recognition of some of the wrongs that had been done to our people, the service people. And uh, so that's how uh, it came about. That, uh, and the tours helped to put us on the map and we became known. And often we had more Caucasian people coming on the tour, and eventually it involved that uh, I did tours for students or someone, you know, coming about the teachers at Howard University and Renee Ingram with the program that she had. So uh, it was, um, it's been continuing since the very time we started in 73. Now, do you remember when, I think you said uh, Peter Smith and his spouse, when they first came to you and asked you uh, to do a tour, and I, I'm assuming you hadn't done tours before. No, what never. You, what, was your, what was your reaction or response when they oh, asked well, you to do Oh, well, our this? committee, we, we worked together. We worked it out. And uh, at that time, uh, David Corey used to do a lot of photography for us. And uh, we uh, just got together. We assembled... Uh, 
at the Safeway was there at where the UPO building was on 3rd and Rhode Island Avenue. We would assemble there and greet people and uh, we'd start the walking tour. We'd start it around and then end up by um, Bryan Street where the James McGill home that he had lived in. That would be the end of our tour. And uh, then we'd come back, circle all back, and go, uh, if we didn't come to my house for the slides, we sometimes went to David's yard for the garden party. And he always had beautiful flowers, and uh, his wife, Carol, the late Carol Corey, was so gracious in providing us with tea and cookies and fruit and condiments. <laughs> So you, so you mentioned you were you maybe surprised that the majority of the people who were on the Smithsonian tours were were whites. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about some of the people who were outside of of the Detroit Park neighborhood who were interested in celebrating the neighborhood or interested in promoting it as a historic district? Well, I know one person in particular, a Mr. Press. He was so pleased with our tour. He brought me a picture of Boundary Street that we did not have in the McClellan Mansion. And um, I had a lady named Mrs. Gephardt. She wrote me a letter explaining, well, they would go back and tell uh, Joy Samuelson, I think she was the coordinator uh, from the Smithsonian, that they enjoyed my tours, except <laughs> I didn't have a loud voice. And eventually I got a, a thing that you talk through so they could hear me. and. Uh, but they would say that our tours were well planned and they loved ha having the refreshments and enjoying the slides. And uh, I did students, especially from Howard University. I've done some uh, teachers one year. A group of teachers came through for a tour from the D.C. Teachers College. So when was uh, historic, uh, the historic uh, district status actually granted uh, to, the, to the neighborhood? 73. It had, it was before 76, 1976. I had the paper once, the papers, <laughs> but right now I don't have it. Uh, it was around, it, it took three years really. And you started in 73. 73, yes, so and by 76 we had uh, the historic status, and uh, that was uh, the bicentennial year. So, We've, we've talked quite a bit about the, the, the neighborhood getting historic district status, and you said that, that, that was, there was an ad hoc committee that was primarily responsible for that. So once that process was over, uh, can you talk a little bit about what are some of the other uh, activities, issues, um, but maybe activities and projects that the Civic Association was involved in? Oh, as we had a wonderful... Um well, she was a coordinator for the trips, Catherine Latney. She knew how to get a bus trip. We went to the park. We went to Atlantic City. We went uh, to dinner theaters, and uh, we had a picnic out. Uh, th this was really funny. We had a picnic at Fort Hunt one summer, and uh, Mr. Brown forgot and left the permit at home. So <laughs> they said, uh, oh. Roland forgot the permit, and we were so far away. I said, don't worry. If the police come, just send them to me. Sure enough, a little boy, one of our little boys, strayed onto another lot and got in a fight with a little boy on the next lot. And here they came over, and they said, uh, who's running this picnic? And everybody looked around, and they said, Miss Jackson. I said, yes. He said, where's your permit? I said, permit? I said, oh, we have it. I said, we have it. I said, what's the problem? He said, these little boys are, I said, oh, we'll settle that. I said, we'll settle that. I said, I'm a teacher at Horace Mann School. I said, we'll get it settled. And I said, thank you. You won't have a problem with us. So they went on away. And I said, well, I didn't mean for you guys to bring them to me. I was just talking off my head. <laughs> oh. So that was some of the wonderful summers we had, picnics and um, parties, uh, little teas or something like that. And we met in our homes uh, often uh, in committees and uh, talked about issues of the day. And uh, we especially enjoyed going to the Federation of Civic Associations. And I used to go to that meeting also as a representative of the Civic Association.
Ms. Jackson, you gave us a little bit, uh, actually quite a bit about the, the history of LaDroit Park as a neighborhood back in the late um, 1870s and talking about Amzi Barber as um, the original, one of the original founders of the neighborhood. What we haven't really talked about it is in terms of its um, exclusivity, in terms of its racial exclusivity. Can you talk a, a little bit about um, how, how it started racially? Well, uh, the vision of the founders, it was a planned community for Caucasian people. And uh, in this uh, community that they were going to develop, they hired an uh, architect, James McGill, and they um, had a plan where the streets were laid out and named for trees. And like you had Spruce Street running east and west. You had Linden Street and Larch Street running north and south. You had Maple Avenue, which really was like the main street. U Street and Maple Street were like two main streets. Then you had the circle, which today is the Anna J. Cooper Circle. That was a focal point in the design. At one time, it had a fountain. At one time, after it was incorporated into the city, the buses ran, ran up there and stopped at the circle. I think it was a trolley car. I'm not sure. But always on the edge of Leroy Park, there was the McClellan Mansion, which was not part of the uh, Amzie Barber tract. They already were there. They, they were incorporated into the planned subdivision. And uh, we had 6th Street, which was Juniper Street, and um, uh, Harewood Road, and 2nd uh, Street was LaDroid Avenue, after LaDroid Langdon, uh, who uh, was the um, father-in-law of uh, Amzi Barber. And his brother-in-law, Andrew Langdon, had helped him in planning the division. And there was a story told to me that uh, Amzie Barber had a little son, and they named him LaDroid Langdon. And he died when he was 10 years old. So that may have been the purpose of naming this place LaDroid Park, although his father-in-law was LaDroid Langdon too, but principally, I think, in memory of his son. And um, we had, uh, until 1901, LaDroid Park was Washington County, and then, um, 1901, it was incorporated into Washington City itself. Then the streets were ch changed to be alphabetical order and a numerical order. And um, our streets are not congruent with uh, 6th Street or 4th Street because of being a separation there where Florida Avenue was like Boundary Street. There's a little catty corner and you have to come in to find 2nd Street down here below and 3rd Street a little below where instead of like 4th Street was the only thoroughfare street that we had. It ran straight through into uh, the city. And at that time, when it was founded, to show it was so exclusive, they had gates that they uh, had at the uh, 6th Street, 6th and T, and at 2nd and Florida Avenue. And then they had a frame gate that came up with, to separate Leroy Park from Howertown which during the Civil War, they had freed slaves coming in and living in the part of Howardtown, between Howardtown and Howard University. And that led to the foundation of Freedman's Hospital, and that's why it was called Freedman's Hospital. The uh, people were coming in, former slaves coming to the city in bad health and whatnot, and they lived almost in shanties. But the students were still going to Howard, and they hated that gate they come home at night or something, you, you know, you were up, up in, excluded from your community. So they had several fights where they tore down the gates up there separating Howertown from uh, Elm Street, I believe it was. And eventually they, uh, they tore down the gate. They had a resolution and they did away with the gates at uh, 6th and Juniper Street and the gate at 2nd and Florida Avenue. And then the Howertown gate, well, the fence, was uh, torn down. And that was in 1901. So can you, can you talk a little bit more about the, I guess, the, the tension that the gates um, represented? What is it, why, what is it a, uh, about the gates that the Howertown residents, well, what were they? What were they principally, um, uh, you had to go to town. 
And when the gates were up there, you didn't have complete access to, for the flow going back and forth. And some of the people were getting jobs and the students felt restricted because they wanted to go into the city and they hated coming back and forth and scaling the fence to get up on the campus. So they had several little riots the way they tore it down and the neighbors didn't like it. And then in 1893, by that time, you had the first black family moving in and then you had more blacks coming into Lee Droid Park. And so they were leaving, the white people were leaving to go to bigger homes that this same Amzie Barber and his company were building up on 16th Street and expanding their architectural, cultural boundaries elsewhere and leaving Lee Droid Park to eventually become a black enclave. Okay. So that, so that the, so LaDroit Park then starts as a predominantly white enclave mm -hmm. and then becomes a predominantly black enclave. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can you, can you tell a little bit of else uh, in terms of what else are the changes uh, in terms of um, the exclusive um, character of the neighborhood, other ways in which it changed? Well, as you know, about 1901, after we became incorporated in the city, we had other builders coming in and more houses were being built. Infill houses were being built. We had apartments that were named for the streets and we had other developers. Uh, Mr. Baines, a man named Mr. Baines built some houses. Then we had the nice uh, brick structures on Florida Avenue with the stone fronts. Uh, they were uh, changing and more styles of architecture were being filled in between the homes that were originally planned by James and McGill. And uh, as uh, time went by, some of the homes uh, were not kept up because they, the owners died and they didn't have descendants and they were led to be in disrepair. And uh, so that was uh, one of the problems when it became an all-black uh, community or an enclave from the city. And uh, that led to uh, jealousy and people, uh, well, until 1954 when the housing code was broken down that we could move anywhere. We didn't have to just live in Leedroyd Park. Some of the first people to flee to the new uh, broken boundaries were people in Leedroyd Park moving to Brookland or Upper 16th Street or wherever and uh, leaving mansions here for relatives that could not keep them up and they were just abandoned in some cases, almost really abandoned by the uh, people who had once lived here. So you seem to be suggesting then that, that the Droit Park then started, say, as a relatively wealthy white uh, exclusive community and then became a relatively wealthy black community by, say, the early 1900s by 1920s, but say by World War II, then the, 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 the classes changed. It, well, it was uh, when the code, uh, the housing covenant was broken, and then you could move wherever you could buy a home. But as per se as saying wealthy in LeDroy Park, their wealth was in their education and in their training and in their aspirations. It wasn't that their jobs were paying them a lot of money. And then some, we had some entrepreneurs that did make money and lived in Leroy Park that did very well. And, uh, but for the most part, the people were uh, in nominal type jobs, teaching doctors, lawyers. And, uh, but uh, when they, the housing code broke, then they moved to what they called, we used to call it the Gold Coast or Platinum Coast or wherever. <laughs> and I remember once a girl said, you still live in old Lee Joy Park? I said, yes, I do, and I love it. And then uh, another time, uh, well, people were just, we, we had a way about us that said, the way you dress and where you live <laughs> marked you more as a person than what was your character, what was your innate feelings about things and how you carried yourself. So in Leroy Park, we never had to worry about, you know, how many fancy cars you have in the driveway 
or how many bathrooms. I remember once we had a reference from a very prominent person. They said, why do you want to be historic? Those houses only have one bathroom. But today we got power rooms. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really, uh, I've just been here, and I'm an old stick in the mud type person anyway. I don't change. You know, it was the same as it was when I first came here. And uh, I've just enjoyed every year that I've been here. I like the people here. And uh, I'm proud to be a Washingtonian in Lee Joy Park. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mrs. Loretta Jackson, for welcoming me into your home and the audience into your home and sharing your memories and your stories and uh, your love of this neighborhood. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.